This is my M1 Max, pretty much loaded out MacBook Pro. I spent nearly $4,000 on it and I've now owned it for a couple of months and <laughs> well, I'm starting to regret my purchase somewhat. Now, I know that the reviews of this MacBook Pro, including my own, have been mostly glowing, but today, rather than doing, you know, one of the typical three month later, two month later type reviews, I wanna talk about why I'm actually regretting going for this particular MacBook. So stay tuned, get subscribed, hear me out, because this one should be interesting. All right, so what the heck am I talking about? The This MacBook Pro basically fixed all of the issues that we had with the previous generation MacBook Pro. We've got a class leading display, truly, mini LED, ProMotion, these thin bezels, and yeah, sure, there's a notch, but in that notch is a 1080p webcam, finally. We've been asking for that for quite a while. We've got a really solid keyboard. They got rid of the touch bar. We've got fantastic speakers. They brought the ports back. They made the design thicker, which allows for better cooling. And there's ports again, and there's MagSafe again. I mean, this is basically everything that we have been asking for from the MacBook, except for upgradability and recyclability. Apple still needs to work on that, but I doubt that they're going to. But apart from that, they basically gave us everything that we wanted. So why am I regretting my $4,000 purchase? And I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's not just because of the money. I have no qualms spending $4,000 or more dollars on a piece of technology that is going to provide value for me. I spent five grand on my iMac Pro and did not regret that at all. I think that was probably the best $5,000 I ever spent. I've owned that thing for two years. I've edited over a hundred videos on it. So it's not just about, you know, sticker shock of $38.99, which is what this MacBook Pro cost. To explain what I'm talking about, I've also got a small army over here of other MacBooks. These are all MacBooks that I use currently or previously. I've got, you know, the M1 MacBook Pro. I've got the 14 inch MacBook Pro, which is very, very intriguing. Um, and then I've got also a 15 inch Butterfly Keyboard 2019, and then the outgoing Intel 16 inch MacBook Pro also from 2019. So th there's a lot going on here and all of these computers are flawed in some way. You know, I might be an Apple sheep, but I'm not stupid enough to be able to overlook the glaring issues that a lot of these computers have. I mean, butterfly keyboard, that's a, that's a pretty big one. Then there's the 16 inch, which was outdated almost immediately after it came out. And while it was pretty good at first, didn't really hold up all that well. These aren't super desirable and their prices are tanking, which means if you paid retail for them like I did, you're losing a lot of money. That's a pretty big flaw. Then you've got the 14 inch MacBook Pro, which does have its own flaws, mainly the fact that it's down thermally pretty significantly in comparison to the 16 inch. The battery life also suffers in comparison to not only the 16 inch, but also the M1 MacBook Pro, but actually, you know, come to think of it, I think the M1 MacBook Pro is probably the least flawed of that entire pile that I pulled out there. And there's really one simple reason for that. It's the M1 chip. The M1 chip, in my opinion, is more successful as an ambassador for what Apple is trying to do than the M1 Max is. So let's set this aside for a second. So this MacBook Pro right here, as I mentioned, isn't necessarily the best value. I think the MacBook Air is probably the way to go, but both of these are now over a year old. So you'd think, you know, it's a year old, the design here is six years old. This isn't a fresh or super flashy and exciting product like the new MacBook Pros. And yet it's just really, really good. And one of the reasons it's really, really good is because it's, it's sort of somewhat unique in that this package, the M1 laptop package, is almost unbeatable. 
I mean, you go out there right now, go on Amazon, Newegg, Best Buy, wherever you wanna go, find me a PC laptop that can check all of these boxes. High resolution, 13 inch color accurate display, aluminum, super sturdy build quality, has similar performance as an M1, but also only consumes around 15 to 20 watts of power, can get about 20 hours of battery life, and costs around $1,000. If you can find a PC laptop that can do all of those things, I will be legitimately surprised because that's what makes the M1 so good. Every single part of this package beats out what PC laptops have to offer. You cannot get a, a laptop this powerful, that's also this efficient, that's also this well-built, that's also this portable, that also has this much battery life, right? You've got all of those things going for the M1 chip in both the MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air. However, if we go and we look at the M1 Max, the same is just not true. Can you get a PC laptop that is more powerful than this for $3,899? Oh yeah, absolutely. A lot more and a lot less. That is a pretty big difference. And yes, I know you can get a computer that is more powerful than the M1 chip for $1,000. But the trick is that overall package. And while this is a tremendous overall package, at this price point, it's a little bit hard to make the same argument that you can't find something that beats all of it. Because you can find premium high-end laptops with really good build quality that are also cheaper and more powerful. That is not true of the M1 MacBook Pro. That's just the hard truth of the situation. I know Apple compared the M1 Max with a 32 core GPU to the best of the best. They compared it to the RTX 3080 mobile. I have yet to figure out how exactly they made that comparison because in all the tests that I've run, it don't stack up like that. I mean, you, you look at Blender, right? Blender is now Apple Silicon native, so they don't have the excuse of running in Rosetta. I just ran a Blender BMW test on here, it took three minutes and 10 seconds. On an RTX 3080 mobile, it takes 10 seconds. So, I mean, hello, that's a big difference. If you use Blender, then an RTX 3080 mobile, which you can get in a Razer Blade 15 for less than this, significantly less, is insanely faster, much, much faster. In fact, I think this, the coverage of this MacBook Pro and how fast it is, has been slightly skewed by the fact that a lot of people who make YouTube videos, and I'm guilty of this as well, are video editors. And that is where this thing is really, really good. Um, and now that's not to diminish the value of this MacBook Pro, of course. If you do video editing, then having those two dedicated media encoders makes a big difference. I'm actively in the process of switching over to Apple Silicon for my production, and that is a huge factor. But quite simply, if you don't do video editing, you know, you're not a Final Cut Pro user, well, there's, there's other options. And while some of you might be able to disagree and point to aspects about this high-end $4,000 MacBook that are class leading, like the battery life, like the display, the issue uh, is gonna get worse, I'm afraid, because you know right now CES is going on, Intel and AMD are guns ablaze and they're coming out with insanely powerful chips. AMD is saying they're getting 30% more performance out of their top-end CPU. Their top-end CPU performs pretty much on par with this MacBook Pro, so right away, this thing has only been out for two months and AMD is already gonna be pulling out a lead on that. Intel had this graph where they showed not only the, the new Core i9 Alder Lake chip running circles around the M1, but they're also claiming that they can get better performance at 35 watts, which is what the M1 Pro and Max use. And if they can do that with the Core i9, then I suspect that there will be Core i7s that are able to perform at a similar level, albeit probably with higher power consumption and less good thermals, but you know the, the point still stands here. What made the M1 chip so special 
was that it did everything. It wasn't just that it had really good battery life or really good efficiency, it was also really powerful. It was also really well-priced. And this doesn't have all of those things going for it. This isn't terribly well-priced. And with the current competition, to be honest, it isn't more powerful than what AMD and Intel and Nvidia have to offer right now. But the bigger problem is that it's not gonna get fixed very soon because Apple's Apple Silicon transition isn't exactly on the same pace as Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA updates have been. They don't have as many SKUs and they're not updating them as often and that puts them at an inherent disadvantage. I mean, the M1 Max came out in October, but it's based on the M1 chip, which came out in November of 2020. So this has already been out for more than a year and by the looks of things, it's gonna be two years before an M2 chip which isn't expected to be that much more powerful, comes out. So at that rate, we should expect to see an M2 Max. Wow, that sounds terrible. That's, they gotta work on that. that we shouldn't expect that until like October of 2023. Very unlikely that we're gonna see an update to the MacBook Pro with a new processor this year. Almost certainly that's not gonna happen. The 16 inch MacBook Pro is a fantastic, machine in its base configuration. I highly recommend the M1 Pro variant, the 2699 configuration with one terabyte of storage, 16 gigs of RAM, the M1 Pro 10 plus 16. I think that is the sweet spot here. If you like the size, if you need the size, you're getting all of the benefits. You're getting the form factor, the ports, the battery life, the thermals, and this amazing display. And I think that is a compelling price point. For $1,100 more than that, I don't think I'm getting $1,100 in additional value, and I'm certainly not going to be beating out PC laptops at this price point. And so for that reason, I think this particular high-end M1 Max 16-inch MacBook Pro is probably not the way to go. I think realistically, if you want the most powerful M1 Max, the smart move is gonna be waiting for it to get to the Mac Mini because then you don't have to pay for the laptop form factor and it'll probably be under $3,000 to get this equivalently specced, you know, M1 Max, 32 core, 64 gigabyte of RAM, one terabyte SSD. You'll probably be able to do that for under 3K, pair it with whatever monitor of your choosing and I think that'll be a pretty decent value. But as it stands right now, Apple has some work to do. They are on the back foot right now. They're playing catch up to Intel, AMD, and Nvidia on the high end. And I can't wait to see what they do next, but it's a tall order, it really is. And don't get me wrong, that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. I think Apple having some competition, all of these manufacturers competing with each other, that's what gets us better prices, better performance, and a better overall package. So don't get me wrong, I love competition. Apple needs to step it up and I can't wait to see what they come up with. If you can't wait to see what I come up with in my next video, <laughs> look at that. Make sure to get subscribed, leave a like down below, follow me on Twitter at Luke Miani. Stay tuned in the community tab. I've got some uh, interesting stuff coming up soon and I'll see you all in the next video.